Welcome to Hill Country Homilies, weekly homilies from Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church in Liberty Hill, Texas. Holy Annunciation is an old calendar Orthodox Church, sharing the faith of the apostles and the love of Christ with all who seek His truth. Now let's listen to this week's homily. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our last two homilies on the topic of living a Christian life in the age of internet isolation and elections, we looked at how we interact with people who differ from us religiously and then how we react to the death of a person who we disagree with on matters of morals, ethics, or public policy. Today we're going to begin exploring orthodox involvement in politics and elections and particularly within the construct of our Republican by this small r Republican form of government, which is a form of democracy, but not direct democracy. I think this will be a homily that will require two weeks. So we'll lay some background this week and then we'll jump into the more individualized issues next week. So as we begin this exploration, I want to share with you that as a priest, I absolutely abhor these federal elections every four years. Not anything about the elections. I mean, I could abhor them because of the myriad deficiencies of, of the candidates that we have to choose from. I could abhor them because of the focus on secular matters that just sucks all the air out of our atmosphere for months and months leading up to every November. But in reality, the reason that I abhor this time is because of what it does to us. How in the heat of electoral politics, time and again, I witness people abandon civility, love, and kindness in the pursuit of victory in a contest of worldly power. It is as if the lure of power, not even power for us, but just for power for somebody that we support, leads us to forget so much of what we focus on throughout the years which precede these election years. So with that in mind, I want to begin with a brief discussion of orthodoxy and our political system, because I think it is important to understand that the idea of a free people in control of their own governance through a principle of democratic election of their leaders is a concept that is linked inextricably with modernity. It is a product of the enlightenment of 18th century political philosophy and the embrace of classical liberalism, which should never be confused with a minute for a minute with what we call liberalism today. Um, but during the time that this political philosophy, which now governs us, was being formed, there was no orthodox involvement in that movement whatsoever. The orthodox populations at the time lived in Russia primarily under a monarchical system, which was dominated by serfdom. And they lived under the domination of the Ottoman Turks in Greece, Turkey, the Middle East, the Balkans. The interaction of the church with this fledgling idea of representative democracy was non-existent because the Orthodox were not established to any degree in the areas where this grand experiment was to be undertaken. We can be sure that no church father ever wrote on this issue because this ideal was beyond their conception. In fact, it could be said that not until the Greek Republic took shape in the late 60s or the fall of the Soviet Union in the 90s was there ever even a need for the church to begin to examine in what manner Orthodox Christians should be expected to engage in the democratic political process. Unlike so many other things, we approach this question with much of a blank slate but we're not without some guidance, both in scripture and in history. Looking first at history, we should note that first and foremost, 
the relations between the church and the government have usually been marked by persecution and animosity. Whether you are speaking of the early Roman persecutions that continued even after the Edict of Milan, or the far more recent subjugation of the church to the Soviet state, the relations between the state and the church have generally been characterized by antagonism. And even when that antagonism has not risen to the level of torture or execution, it has still been present in the form of pressures on the church to conform itself to the world. For instance, in the 1920s, the Church of Finland was pressured greatly by the government to adopt the Gregorian calendar in order to distance itself from the Russian church. And so even to this day, the Church of Finland operates under a completely different calendar than the rest of Orthodoxy. Even their Easter is on the Roman calendar, not the Orthodox calendar. And that is a result of the intervention of the government into the life of the church there. There's often a longing in orthodoxy, I, I perceive, for this ideal of symphonia, which is a partnership between the church and the state, which work in tandem then to address both the spiritual and the secular demands of a nation. And this idea of symphonia was found both in the Byzantine Empire and in the early Russian Empire. But we have to understand that this practice, first off, was short-lived in both instances. And secondly, as some his church historians comment, it was often more abused than it was actualized. Yes, Metropolitan Philip of Moscow did rebuke Ivan the Terrible for living an unorthodox life, as in Symphonia, the ruler of the church should do to the ruler of the secular state. But he was also thrown in prison and killed for doing that. That's not really Symphonia, as I think many people long for. Likewise, scripture suggests that we must be very wary of both the power of the state and the demands of state citizenship. I often mention in my homilies that every Sunday we sing the second antiphon, put not your trust in princes or in sons of men in whom there is no salvation. During election season, all the more so, I like to mention that, because there seems to be an overwhelming temptation to believe that a politician, a man or a woman, who's already seeking to aggregate worldly power to themselves, which is not a Christian ideal, that this person is going to save us or they're going to restore us or maybe we remember this so slogan, bring us change that we can believe in. See how closely these claims mimic religious imagery, faith, salvation, redemption. There's a reason for that. Man, man is hardwired with the knowledge of his creator being made in his image and being revealed to us in the world in which we live in. So the use of language of soteriology in the political election cycle is no accident because it speaks to our inward self. Hope of our salvation has motivated Christians to act even to the point of their death for two millennia. All politicians need to convince us of is to go down to the ballot and pull the lever and cast our vote. They're certainly not above co-opting the language that we use to try to push that motivation on us. This is why the following line of that same antiphon is so important. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. There is no salvation in politics. The following line of that antiphon is, but the Lord will live forever. We have other verses that we find in scripture which people sometimes twist to their own benefit. Of course, we have Christ's words to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Which reminds us that the, elect that the election that we're trying to win is not an election on this earth. 
right? Our goal isn't to be the elect of the people, it's to be the elect of God. Let's not confuse that with the elections that we deal with. You know, St. John Chrysostom of this verse, my kingdom is not of this world, says Christ, when he says this, he undoes what Pilate had feared, which was the suspicion that Christ intended to seize kingly, earthly power. People take this verse and they carry it forward to the frequent temptation to either directly uh, well, back up. The twisting of scripture for political purposes often leads to people carrying forward towards a temptation to either directly or indirectly claim the endorsement of God for any candidate. The idea that Christ or God needs any particular outcome in an election is blasphemous. God has no need. Man has needs, but God doesn't. How often do we hear this verse? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And it's often cited as some sort of divine appointment of the government. But in fact, it's a warning that the state is due only those things that are not a detriment to godliness. Because those demands of the state that offend godliness become a tribute to the devil, not to Caesar. Finally, we have Paul's instruction in Romans 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, this verse is one of the most misused in the scripture when it comes to understanding politics and government. This verse is often used improperly to support the idea that a particular leader, whoever it is, is God chosen. And we see this in electoral politics all the time, most often from the evangelical leaders who declare their, their candidate to be God chosen. Um, but this is what John Chrysostom said about that verse. Paul writes this to show that Christ did not introduce his laws for the purpose of undermining the state, but rather so that it should be better governed. He does not speak about individual rulers, but about the principle of authority itself. Understand what the golden mouth is saying. If you use this first to prop up a person, an individual ruler, you're teaching falsely. And think about it, if you did that, you'd have to do that to every single elected official, even those that you don't like. And nobody ever does that. It's their candidate, their, their official that's God chosen. The other one seems to always be of the devil. But you can't play with scripture that way. And what St. John is telling us is that's not what that verse is about. It's about the idea of authority in general, not any individual ruler. And if you have any doubt about this at all, please go read the eighth chapter of 1 Samuel and understand how people often and frequently seek worldly authority, not as an appointment of God, but as a substitute for God. So brothers and sisters, let us approach next week with this background. First, there's little to no theological exploration of a democratic model of governance and the responsibilities of an Orthodox Christian in that model. And there's certainly no exploration of any ancient provenance. We do, however, have a long history of persecution of Christianity by the state and a strong basis in scripture to warn us against trusting too greatly in the abilities or ambitions of any earthly ruler. And finally, we also have this very important caution that we must never try to replace God with an earthly king, whether it's purposeful or I think in most cases, not even understood that that's what's going on. So next week, We'll continue our homily series and we'll examine how Orthodox Christians might slip into those very habits. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Thanks for listening to Hill Country Homilies. For more information, visit Holy Annunciation Orthodox Church at www.annunciationtx.com. And please join us again next week.